Okay, now moving on, we're going to be talking about the different, um, two of the different types of reactions that you'll see in chemistry. Um, the first one is precipitation reaction, and the second is redox. So let's talk a little bit about what the precipitation reaction is. It's a kind of what we call double displacement reaction. And in a double displacement, displacement reaction, that means that you have two sets of usually ionic compounds and they are going to swip, switch partners or swap partners so that you form two completely new compounds. The best way of describing how to make compounds is by taking the outside two species and combining them and then taking the inside two species and combining them. So you'll produce two new, completely new compounds. Now, the reason we have to write these two new compounds this way is to follow the convention for writing compounds. Remember that the positive ion always comes first. So remember that here you have a positive ion and C is also positive. So that means that in this compound AD, A must come first as well as C coming first here. So this is not only a double displacement reaction, but in a precipitation reaction, one or more of the products is actually going to what we call precipitate out of the solution. So in other words, it's going to look like you have particles of solid falling out of your solution and collecting at the bottom. Okay, I have a demo to show you. Okay, on this demo, on the left, you'll see a beaker and it is full of potassium chromate. Uh, and that's the yellow stuff. The colorless liquid is lead 2 nitrate. When I add the lead nitrate to the potassium chromate, watch very carefully, do you see that furry mixture? That is so particles of solid coming out of the solution and collecting at the bottom. I think if I move my camera, you can see that the solid has collected at the bottom. Those are the solid particles precipitating out of your solution. Now, if I add more of the lead to nitrate, you'll see more of that phenomenon. Let's talk about the chemistry of what you just saw. So in the, we added some of the colorless liquid to the, liquid in, the yellow liquid in the beaker. And it's going to follow this chemical reaction. Now if we take the outside two species and combine them, we'll have potassium and nitrate. And if you need a refresher on how to form these compounds using their standard charges, Make sure that you go back to um, lecture 1.2 in the nomenclature section and you'll be able to review how to do this. And then you're going to take your inside two species, the lead and the chromate ion. Both of those have a plus two charge, um, lead has a plus two and chromate has a minus two. So this is what you'll form. In order to balance your equation, you'll need to put a 2 in front of the potassium nitrate. Now, one of these, this, this what we have right here doesn't tell the full story of what we saw. One of these two species here, one of the products, is what fell to the bottom. We have to indicate that in some way. This table 
Jewel. You can download a copy of this um, on Jewel. This table takes you through how to calculate which of your products is going to be your precipitate. Your precipitate equals the thing that is insoluble. If something is insoluble, that means that it does not dissolve in water. If it doesn't dissolve, it will fall from your solution, making it the precipitate. So precipitate means insoluble. Okay, the way you're going to use this table is by looking mostly at your, your anion species. And remember that we had the lead, we had, we produced in our demo KNO3 and then the lead chromate. Okay. We'll use a little bit of process of elimination here. KNO3, you can find the NO3 here. All NO3 compounds are soluble, and there are no exceptions. That means that this cannot be our precipitate, because that's our substance that's soluble. Therefore, using process of elimination, this is our precipitate. The way we are going to indicate this in our chemical reaction is by placing the symbol for solid at the bottom of our compound. S does not stand for soluble, it stands for solid. Now, if we are going to tell the full story about the entire chemical reaction, we need to include our other, what are called states of matter, And now for each of the things that's soluble, it gets the AQ symbol. AQ stands for aqueous, and aqueous means in a watery solution. So if you have AQ, that means you are in watery solution, <clears throat> in other words, which means you're soluble and you are all liquid. No little particles of solid at all. Okay, let's do some more practice of, let's just predict products for right now. Okay, so when I ask you to predict the products of a reaction, I'm going to give you two reactants, and then I'm going to want you to combine them into the products um, that are formed when you actually carry the reaction out. So here we're going to take the outside two and the inside two and combine them. So we'll have silver bromide and HNO3, which is nitric acid. Okay, same thing for the next problem, outside and inside. Here we have cadmium sulfide and HCl, which is hydrochloric acid. Now, the important thing to know when you're predicting these products is that you're forming these compounds based on the standard charges of your elements. So, just because I have a 2 here and a 2 here, doesn't mean I should do something like this. That is improper. That is not how that compound is formed. Therefore, in order to balance our chemical equation, instead of adding the twos inside the compound, we're just going to add a stoichiometric coefficient on the outside of the entire compound. Okay, outside and inside for this problem, we're going to form KCl and HOH. HOH is another way of writing H2O. This is its standard formula, so this is what you should use. This is how you predict products. Now let's talk
talk more about predicting the precipitate. So here I've made a list of all of the products that we made in those three previous examples. Let's take a look at each of them on the chart. Okay, so chlorine and, and iodine are the same as bromine. Bromine's not on your chart. So all of the bromides are soluble except for when they are bonded with silver, um, HD2, 2 plus, and lead 2. Here you have the exception to the rule, and so therefore this is going to be insoluble. Is HNO3 soluble or insoluble? NO3, all of them are soluble. So if it is soluble, we write AQ. How about cadmium sulfide? Well, here's your sulfide. And here it says they're insoluble except for group 1A, 2A, and NH4+. Okay, NH4+, it's not that. And cadmium is not in group 1 or 2A. So therefore, cadmium sulfide is insoluble. HCl, all the chlorines are soluble except for one of these three. H is not. Therefore, this is soluble. Again, not one of the exceptions. And water was a um, product on the last problem of our last slide. I put water on here because water is neither aqueous nor is it, is it solid. Water, when it's formed as a compound, is a pure liquid. Therefore, it's given the L designation. So that's a small L. This chart can be a little bit tricky to use. Make sure that you're reading all the way across the line to make sure that you're looking for the exception. Okay, let's do an example from your homework to reinforce this problem. On page 157, number 58 says, predict whether a precipitate will form when aqueous solutions of the following compounds are mixed. If a precipitate will form, write its formula and write a net ionic equation for its formation. We'll get to the net ionic equation in just a minute, but let's just predict the products for right now. Okay, so for outside inside, we're going to get calcium phosphate. So we're going to have calcium has a 2 plus charge, and phosphate has a 3 minus. Combine them. So we have Ca3PO4 2. And then KCl for your inside group. Now balance this equation. Now predict which one of these two is your precipitate. KCl, and we said that all of the chlorides are soluble except for one of these three. Potassium is not one of those three, so KCl is soluble. And then we have phosphate. All phosphates are insoluble. Oh, sorry about that. All phosphates are insoluble except for group 1A and NH4. And Calcium is not in group 1A, it's in group 2A, so that is not one of the exceptions. Therefore, this is your precipitate. Okay, try this one on your own. Make sure you balance your equation and identify your precipitate. have a 3 here, that's wrong. It must be FeOH2 because here your iron had a charge of plus 2. Okay, let's talk about some, the 
the concept of total ionic equations. In a total ionic equation, we're going to take all of our aqueous species and break them apart into their separate ions. An important thing to know is that we're only doing this for the aqueous substances, not for gases, solids, or liquids. Those all stay together. Okay, so let's do an example of what I'm talking about here. Here I've recopied our answer to um, part A for that number 58 that we were looking at from the book. So now here I want us to break apart all of our compounds into their ions. Okay, let's start over here. We have calcium chloride. There are two ions in this compound. There's the calcium and the chloride. Find down your periodic table where calcium is. It's in group 2A. So what is its standard charge? 2 plus. Now, when you are writing total ionic equations, you're talking about ions here. If your ions don't have charges, they're not ions. So every time you don't write a charge down for one of your ions, you're going to lose points. So be careful with this stuff. Now, because this substance is aqueous, we are going to also label it as such when we're talking about just the individual ion. Also, all of the stoichiometric coefficients apply to all of the separate ions in your compound. Therefore, because there's a 3 out in front of the calcium chloride, we need to put a 3 in front of the calcium ion. Okay. Now, let's take a look at that for the chloride ion. In the compound itself, we're showing that we have two chloride ions, and we also have three of the total compound. So how many chloride ions do we have? Three times two is six. And there we've successfully broken apart our first compound. Same thing for potassium phosphate. We have a 3 in front of the potassium, and there are 2 of the total compound. Therefore, we have 6 total potassium ions. Potassium has a charge always of plus 1. It's in group 1A. Now, here's where things get a little bit tricky. You have to have a good working knowledge of all of the polyatomics on your pink sheet. If you're still feeling a little bit rusty on that, I need you to go through and study those a little bit on your own. This entity right here, the phosphate, is a separate ion. And we are going to treat it as one whole part. The phosphate does not get broken down here when we're writing the net ionic equation. In fact, let's go back over here write on our rules for the total ionic equation. Do not break apart polyatomic ions. Okay, so here we have all the information for our reactants. Remember what I said? You're not going to break apart these solids, gases, or liquids. Here you have a solid. Therefore, we're just going to transfer it as it's written into our total ionic equation. That's the best part because that's easy. Okay, now let's break apart the KCl. There are six Ks, and there are six chlorines. This is how you write a total ionic equation. Now let's talk about the net ionic equation. The net ionic equation is almost identical, except that now we're going to cancel out the ions that appear on both sides of the reactions. 
In order to cancel things out, the ions must be identical. Okay, so here is that total ionic equation that I copied down from before. What do you see that's identical on both sides of the equation? There are two species. So now once we've canceled them out, for writing our, our net ionic equation, we're going to write down or recopy everything else other than the things that we canceled out. So we'll have our three calciums plus the two phosphates. or yields the precipitate. This is your net ionic equation. There is a special name for the things that get canceled out. They are called spectator ions. that you're canceling out, those are called spectator ions. The reason they're called spectators is because they could have any identity. It doesn't matter who they are. They just have to be there. Just like, you know, spectators at, a, at, at, at Lambeau Field. Aaron Rodgers is still going to throw all, the, all those touchdowns and no interceptions. It doesn't matter who's in the stands. example from the typed out version of your homework. So this is number one on the addendum. Okay. Complete and balance the following double displacement reactions. Write complete ionic and net ionic equations for each reaction. Be sure to include states of matter for each chemical species. Okay. So let's do outside inside. So we'll have zinc, hydroxide plus KCl. Now you're kind of going to have to balance, so you'll add two here and a two there. Now, in order to know how we can start writing our total and then ionic equations, we need to go back and predict our um, precipitate. And let's see, we had zinc hydroxide. We know that KCl by this time is soluble. So hydroxide. All hydroxides are insoluble except group 1A, calcium, barium, and strontium. We don't have any of those exceptions here, so this is our solid. Okay. Let's write our total ionic equation. Zinc has a 2 plus charge. There are two chlorine ions. There are two potassium ions. And there are two OH polyatomic ions. Now you should be able to write the entire reaction out on one, one line of paper. I can't do that here, so that's why I have to continue it down. But if you do write a little larger, that's okay. And my products should include my zinc hydroxide solid and two potassiums and my two chlorines. Who are your two spectator ions?
And then your net ionic equation should have everything else but those crossed off blue things.